Okay, uh, what's up everyone? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over week 16 in the NFL. Uh, we have kind of a goofy slate um, in the sense that everything's on Saturday this week. And we have an eight-game, two-game split uh, on the full 10-gamer here in as far as the AM and PM window goes. Uh, so that's kind of tilting. Um, really nothing super out of the ordinary, though, in, in that respect. Uh, we normally see a 7-3 or a, an 8-4 type of split anyway. So um, same sort of deal in that regard, but everything is on Saturday on Christmas Eve. Um, so happy holidays to everybody that celebrates uh, anything around this time of year. Um, and hopefully we can, we can mash through the latter parts of the NFL season here and see if we can extract some value if we are going to be punting. Um, that said, you know, we'll go over our kind of early week disclaimers. Um, naturally, ownership still noisy, seeing a couple of, you know, we got some red numbers over here in the standard deviations. Um, we also are, still have some places bringing in Jalen Hurts as a starter. Um, other places, like really nobody else has... Uh, Gardner Minshew as the starter announced yet, right? So we're still going to have uh, ownership and projections adjustments that are really going to send a, quite the ripple throughout the rest of the slate um, once we get more news. So same thing with L Lamar Jackson. Not sure if he's going to play yet. And against Atlanta, uh, he would be a smash play at 7,200, assuming he'd be healthy. Um, but it could very well just be Tyler Huntley again. So uh, who knows? Outside of that, uh, we're we're pretty well solidified in in as far as health goes in the quarterback room. Uh, of course, we we've got natural questions with the rest of the skill position players, um, but really nothing out of the ordinary in that regard either. So um, that said, you know, just keep an eye out for you know projections updates as we work through the next couple of days. Um, we'll do what we can on the back end. Uh, to, to pull in everything, make sure that um, for those that want to gamble around this time of year, that um, you know, we've got some data up for you to to go ahead and, and punt to your heart's desire. So that said, let's uh, let's get into it. Um, first game on the docket here, probably going to be one of the more popular games overall, uh, Giants at Minnesota. Uh, both of these defenses very attackable. Uh, we want to attack the Giants defense on the ground mostly, uh, but they're they're definitely gettable in the air or through the air. And we want to attack the Minnesota pass defense through the air, and they are less gettable uh, with the rushing attack. So um, that's really kind of stylistically not the best setup for the the Giants over here, right? They're a pretty rush heavy offense in terms of the number of carries that Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. Um, sort of garner and but at 5600 i mean daniel's only, he's still going to throw the ball right they're they're only about a 55 45 split here are the giants in favor of the rush so um they'll still use saquon in the passing game a little bit at, at 7900 12 percent ownership I think this is a pretty decent play to include into your running back pools as maybe a pivot off of some of the uh dalvin cook on the other side or derrick henry that we'll get to um or cmc late Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, so we can certainly play Daniel Jones. You can play him naked. He's got a lot of rushing upside. But in this particular instance, since he's got a, a really exploitable pass defense on the other side, uh, in in the Vikings, they give up nearly a full 12 yards per catch and 280 yards per game through the air. So there's a lot of upside in the passing game uh, for Daniel Jones here, and I think that means that we could finally include some of his receiving core. Um, I would probably stay off of Daniel Bellinger. He hasn't really seen the target resurgence com similar to his early week or early season numbers, that is. Um, and they've gotten a little bit healthier and more solidified in the wide receiver room with Slayton, Richie James, and Isaiah Hodgins. So I would prefer getting to these guys. Now, value score and projections, they're basically the exact same. I'd prefer to just get to the cheaper guys in that event. And the market kind of agrees so far as we see ownership figures sort of trail off as prices increase on the receivers, you know, from Richie James to Hodgins and Darius Slayton, right, and decrease as we drop down, right? So um, 
my favorite plays here in the wide receiver room would be Richie James or an Isaiah Hodgins. I think you can play both of these guys basically at equal percentages. 10% probably a bit thick uh, just in general, but once again, Minnesota's pass defense, they give up, they give it up in spades. So uh, this is a pretty damn good spot, um, and it could be a little bit off the board as we get to the end of the week we're, with some of these other games maybe steaming a little. Um, so I would play some dimes. I'd play some Saquon and then mix in one of the receivers here. Probably wouldn't play two of them without a Saquon or anything like that uh, because Saquon, like I said, is still going to get his 25 touches. Um, so I, I do like getting to some, some of the Giants here. I think that's a, a pretty decent play. Giants defense, no thank you. Uh, we know that well, they're not very good, number one. And 3,100, don't really like the price. And Minnesota's probably going to score a good bit. So on the other side with the Vikings, uh, what are we going to do? Well, they're still one of the most pass-heavy teams in the league at a full 60-40 split. It's all running through Justin Jefferson as it has pretty much all season. Um, unfortunately, the Minnesota run offense, the rush offense, is not very good. And they're well below league average. They, they only average about 23 attempts a game, four yards a carry, and below, you know, less than 100 yards a game. So um, there's some touchdown equity there for them compared to the league average, a little bit better. But, um, you know, most of the production is coming in the passing game. That's moving them down the field. And then Dalvin's just like falling into the end zone type of stuff. So, um not my favorite running back play to get to necessarily because uh, they're they're really not very good, but I think we can mix him in because I love the price on Dalvin. I, I, he popped a little bit last week. He's shown some flashes of really attacking um, and and popping for the upside that we know he has in the tank. Uh, the problem is they just don't give him the damn ball enough. So um, the issue here that we would run into is is really only that but the giants are, are very very attackable on the ground they give up 5.4 yards a carry and 150 yards per game so there's touchdown equity here for dalvin and there's efficiency equity here as well so i think he's a, a, still a pretty decent play at 7200 we're kind of starving for for running back value um as i've mentioned so i think this is okay to uh to mix in um, and, and get some healthy exposure. 15%, I think, is perfectly fine. Wouldn't go crazy with the 25 to 30% necessarily, um, but I, if you land on that and that's how your builds flesh out, I think it's okay, to be quite honest. Uh, you can play Kirk, though, for sure, at 6,300. I think it's fine, and you can always play JJ. 9,300, though, very stiff price tag, and you're going to need him to pop for 30 at this price tag and at this ownership. So, uh is the ownership at 18% probably too low for the raw upside that he provides? Yes. But at once again, he's 9,300. So you, you need him to get there. Otherwise, you're just dead in the water. So just keep that in mind. Um, Adam Thielen is still the third receiving option in the offense. And I would prefer as a number two to get, just get to TJ Hawkinson. His target share is still pretty damn consistent since coming up, over from Detroit. Um at 4,900, I'm not wild about the price tag since he hasn't really exhibited the same sort of um, scoring upside that he did in that one game in Detroit where he popped for like 43 DK points or whatever, 175 yards and two scores or something. Um, so that hasn't really shown up quite yet in Minnesota, but he's a pretty damn good cash play, and he's probably your cash tight end. Um Outside, you know, if you can't get all the way up to Travis Kelsey or something like that. Um, target share is that solidified for him. So really, really good play here. Um, don't forget about KJ Osborne at low ownership. He popped last week. He could very well pop again this week. Not super jacked about the price, but he, he popped for a huge, huge number um, in a lot of efficiency. He got 16 targets in that game last week uh, against Colts. Now, we can't really expect him to be trailing like that and have to throw the ball that much. But that kind of upside is still in the tank for KJ. So don't forget him if you're you're getting to Minnesota stacks. Uh, Vikings defense, 3,700. No thanks. Uh, I, I think they're too expensive, and I don't think they're very good. And the point-per-dollar value metrics uh, kind of agree. So um, no thanks. All right, moving on. Houston and Tennessee. Uh, I don't want anything to do with Houston uh, as per usual. 
Um, you could consider some Chris Moore. His ownership coming in pretty high at the moment. This is only in the event that uh, I mean, this will only persist in the event that Nico Collins is is out again. Nico's dealing with a foot, I believe. Brandon Cook's dealing with a calf that he's been dealing with. Uh, also, he doesn't want to play for the team. Um, so some questions, some health questions in, in the wide receiver room here. If Nico plays, I'd prefer to get to him, and you'll you'll see this ownership basically invert between the two, um, as it should. So he'll probably assume his number one role again. Uh, Chris Moore will probably drop off, and I don't want to pay this 4700 for Chris Moore. Um, that said, I don't really want to go out of my way to target anybody from Houston anyway. Uh, I don't think Tennessee is going to need to increase pace all that much, but um, you know we see, we've seen in the last two weeks that Houston could compete. They've been competitive all season, despite the fact that they're bad and just losing games left and right. Uh, they have been competitive, and they've been able to cover some numbers. They may have even covered the, the most numbers uh, of anybody in football this year against the spread. So uh, not that that's something we should be paying attention to, but in general, uh, I, I think Houston can offer a little bit of value, just not really in excess. So we're not, we're not dealing with any of these other guys, and, and certainly not the defense. Um, Tennessee, on the other side, well, we want to attack Houston. They're still terrible in rush defense and still terrible in pass defense. Um, more attack. I mean, they're they're really not as bad as as one would assume. Their rush defense has been much better recently uh, in terms of efficiency metrics, but still giving up 4.9 yards a carry and 165 yards on the ground per game. So uh, that that means it's Derrick Henry season. And every time he gets Houston, he torches this team. So uh, really, I think in his last four outings against them, he's rushed for over 200 yards and multiple scores in every single one of those games. Um, yeah, the, the touchdowns could be inaccurate on that stat, but it's definitely over 200 yards, that's for sure. So at 8,600, this ownership at 27%, it's probably going to end up looking pretty low and looking like a steal as we get to the end of the week. Uh, he's going to be, he was 35% last week um, in a, pretty good spot against the Chargers. Uh, this is it, It'll be 40% by the time we get to the end of the week. Uh, it, this is the best running back spot for sure. Um, and if you can get to him, just make sure that you're adjusting for that ownership hit that you're going to take. Um, now, we can't really expect him to, to punch out 200 yards again necessarily, but uh, it, he did it to him earlier this season. So uh, it, it's very well within range. Uh, Ryan Tannehill, it, Tannehill, uh, Tannehill is dealing with, uh, once again, another ankle injury or the, the same ankle or something. I, who knows? Uh, but he's been pretty hobbled. So we actually are seeing a couple places across the industry project Malik Willis uh, to start. So we'll have to keep an eye on this. Um, Tannehill, he was fine, even though he was limping all over the place. Uh, but who knows? That could, like, he's a pro football player and... Um, you know, you could very well have had a broken ankle or something. I mean, what the hell do I know? So uh, that doesn't mean we can play him because if he is hobbled at all, his rushing upside that any of the rushing upside that he offers, it's really mostly in just like quarterback sneak value. He's not going to be scrambling all that well. Um, so no thanks in that regard. Would prefer to just get to Derrick Henry. However, we are getting Robert Woods now down at 4000 uh, And it, now we're talking. At 4000 I like this price. And if you want to get off of some of the Derrick Henry or if you're, for some reason, stacking Tennessee with Tannehill, you can now play Robert Woods, and I think that's all right. We're in full-on punt mode at 4,000 with him, and I think that's playable, but really only in the event that Traylon Burks is out once more. So I have to keep an eye on him as well at 4,600. Uh, I think that makes Tannehill stacks a little bit more viable. Um, and that would take me off of Robert Woods entirely if he plays Traylon. But uh, if he doesn't play, then that makes Woods um, a, a deeper tournament dart. Uh, it, it, it's possible. You, you could throw him into your pools. Same with Nick Westbrook. Uh, really don't want any outsized exposure to him. Um, and really, I mean, if, if Traylon's out, it, like, it's a definite no. Or in rather, it's a definite no. If he's out, then I'm less enthused or less 
about it, but you know, like I probably still would just ignore it. I think there's other guys that we could play. Uh, Austin Hooper, no thank you. We still can't get Chiga Conquo to, to pop here in the early week projections uh, for some stupid reason. He's at 3,500. Um, I think it's an okay play, really only in the event that Traylon is out. Uh, Titans defense, 3,600. Well, Houston's offense stinks. Um, they've been able to compete the last couple of weeks, however, so the Titans defense really stinks too. Like they're bad on, in, in pass defense, really, really strong though in rush defense, 3.6 yards a carry and 81 yards per game allowed for the Tennessee rush defense. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, one of the best rush defenses in the league. So in, in that regard, I think they're really strong. It's probably going to force Houston into throwing the ball a little bit more. So perhaps some more opportunities for the, the Tennessee defense to get there in the turnover department. Um, really unlikely, though, in the sack department. Despite Houston's bad offensive line, they've only give up about two and a half sacks a game. So not a whole hell of a lot of upside here at this price uh, for the Titans defense. Mostly just Derrick Henry here for me. Uh, okay, Buffalo and Chicago. I like this game a little bit. Uh, we got weather concerns, so we have to keep an eye on that. But um, I think we can get to some, you know, less popular Josh Allen, Steph Diggs stacks uh, than normal. You know, a lot of the time we're seeing these guys come in at 12, 15 percent, Steph Diggs at 20 percent. Um, I mean, this is one of the worst defenses in, in football here in Chicago. So, like, why aren't why aren't we playing Buffalo uh, against Bears? Um, obviously, they're expensive and you got to spend 17,000 on two guys. That's it's not great. Uh, but to make it a little bit cheaper, we can get to Gabe Davis. For sure, we have volume concerns, of course, with Gabe. We know that he's got upside, so uh, not my favorite like one-off play necessarily, um, but definitely you can play him in stacks as a, a deeper tournament dart. Um, Devin Singletary I really do like at, at 5,400. The Chicago rush defense is awful. And they've been awful all season, and they give up a hell of a lot of points. So very inefficient in terms of preventing scoring is the – Chicago rush defense, uh, they, they still give up 140, 550 yards a game on the ground, too. So uh, I think Devin Singletary, despite the sort of depressed efficiency metrics for him all this season um, and in the Buffalo rush game in general, pretty average rushing attack outside of Josh Allen. Um, I think he this is a playable spot for him, and he's one of the cheaper running backs that we can get to. Uh, that's it, actually in a a really, really good spot. And, and so far, we're only seeing, what, 4% ownership on the guy. So that's probably not going to steam all that much. Maybe it hits 8 10% or something by the weekend, but that's still something that you can absorb no problem. Um, Bill's defense, 4,000. Yikes. Uh, you can get there. I really don't like playing guys against, against fields anymore. Um, he's not taking sacks anymore, and they're designing a hell of a lot of rushing upside for him into the offense. So... I'm not super excited about playing defenses against him because they don't throw the ball and he'll just run all over him. So um, at an elevated price tag, I'm not jacked about it. Um, and really, frankly, the, the Bills defense isn't all that good as or isn't nearly as, as good as they displayed earlier in the season when they were fantastic. Um, they've come back to earth you know, in a hurry here and they're really just kind of league average across the board in – pass defense and in rush defense. So no, thank you. Um, staying off of the Isaiah McKenzie. Don't think this is the particular slate. And once again, we might have weather concerns here and wind in Chicago. Uh, Dawson Knox. It's all right. He's popped a little bit. He's shown flashes, um, but the volume overall is just, it's just not there for him. So um, not my favorite. I'd preferred, I think there are five or six other tight ends you could probably get to uh, instead. But if you're stacking them, Absolutely, you know, mix them in. Uh, you can also consider, uh, one last thing before we switch, is some James Cook. Some deeper tournament teams um, with James Cook, I, I think, is okay as well. Got volume and upside concerns in that in in the Buffalo Rush offense, but uh, it's it's still playable. Uh, on the other side for Chicago, we, we do have Fields. He was a little hobbled last week, um, but that's just kind of – kind of how he rolls, right? They're they're just going to run him and, and let him... Hopefully he doesn't get really, really hurt. Uh, he's a good enough athlete to stay out of it, but, um, you know, that, that's just kind of the, 
the risk that we take with with a, a rushing quarterback here. Uh, so at 7,500, I think we can play him again. He popped for 25 last week. Thought he was a really really good play, and you could have won tournaments if you made the nuts elsewhere with 25 from your quarterback. And if if you're getting a 20 point floor from Justin Fields, which is basically what we're getting, um, I mean he's got upside of 40, of 45. So that's it's basically a smash play every single week. Um, 7,500, he's going to be less popular than some of the other guys, certainly the Mahomes and the Josh Allens on the other side. Geno, uh, Kirk Cousins up here, all this kind of guy. Like, you're, you're getting Fields, who's got more upside than than Kirk Cousins, at half the ownership or a quarter of the ownership. You know what I mean? So, uh, seems like a pretty damn good play to me. And, like I said, Buffalo's defense is attackable, um, certainly in the in the rush game. Uh, we can play Cole Komet at 4,400. I'm not stoked about the price, but uh, we do know that he has some upside and he is going to be um, a focal point of the passing game whenever they do throw it. But once again, they, they're still only throwing the ball 20, 22 times a game, 135 yards per game coming from the Chicago passing offense. That's uh, one of, if not the worst number, it's got to be the worst number in, in football. So uh, really not excited about mixing in pieces here. But if you do want some exposure to the passing game, just as a little bit of coverage, uh, you can play Cole Komet. Consider Chase, Chase Claypool as well at 4,500. He's a deeper tournament dart. Um, not playing this guy in 20 max or anything like that. It's it's like 150s only. Byron Pringle caught a touchdown pass last week. Um EQ St. Brown has been around all season. Dante Pettis, Dekeel Harrier here. I mean, it's, so they, they've got so many guys, but they still just don't throw the ball to them. So all the volume from the offense is going to come to J, uh, Justin Fields and David Montgomery um, in the running game. So at 6,500 for David Montgomery, the only thing we'd have to keep an eye on here is that Khalil Herbert may very well be back this week. They have activated him from IR, so he could – come in and, and spell David Montgomery a little bit, and that kind of makes me balk a little bit at the $6,500 price tag. Um, and also, I don't want to necessarily go out of my way to be targeting Buffalo's defense, even though they are attackable on the ground. Um, I'd most often just want to do it with Fields and maybe get a little bit of coverage with like a Cole Komet. So um, you can play a Fields, Komet, run it back with a Steph Diggs or, or a Gabe Davis or something like that, or a uh, Devin Singletary. I think these are all playable constructions in deeper tournament stuff. Okay, Seattle and Kansas City. Um, this is kind of the this is really the the biggest game of the week, right? This total sitting uh, 48 and a half, 49 blanket across the markets. Um, since he, seeing a little bit of money, they've been bet up from nine and a half to ten, so it's just kind of like they're playing the the key number game here in the betting markets. Um, I think the 10 is is quite aggressive, to be quite honest. Now, obviously, Seattle is going to be missing Tyler Lockett. He's got a busted finger um, that he's either had surgery on or will or something like that. No matter, he's going to be out. So that's a significant hit to their offensive efficiency, and that's really the only reason that you could play them all year is because they were so balanced between DK and Tyler Lockett. Um now, Kenneth Walker has emerged a little bit over the last couple of months, and he could offer us some value here at 6,400. I think this is fine. I'd rather play him than David Montgomery in the previous game, for example, um, at basically the same ownership. A little, little more steam on, on Walker, but just kind of whatever. Uh, like Geno, though, you know, the absence of Tyler Lockett means that a pass-heavy offense um, is still going to want to throw the ball, and they're probably going to be trailing against Kansas City because their defense can't stock, stop anybody, Seattle's. So all of that stuff is going to go right to DK Metcalf. I think he's one of the best plays of the week. 7,100, I love the price, and I really, really like the spot. Tyler Lockett occupies really more of the downfield threat uh, for the Seattle offense. And DK is really in the sort of shorter to mid-range type of stuff. So I could really see a lot of scenarios here where DK sees an uptick in target share and he could see 15 targets in this game and I, I really wouldn't bat an eye right so um, he normally like in he's done it against Vegas right uh, he has seen 10 plus against the Giants and Carolina right so we know that the target upside and the volume upside is there for DK and that was with Tyler Lockett so um 
this ownership is going to steam and it'll be pushing 20% by the end of the week. I think you still come in overweight on that. I think this is a fantastic play. You can play him as a one-off, play him in stacks with Geno and, and Kenneth Walker if you want. You can also play Marquise Goodwin at 4,300. He's probably going to slip into the number two role and the more downfield type of role that, that Tyler Lockett occupies normally. So I think this is a really good tournament play as well at 4,300. I love the price and the very likely volume up uptick um got to keep an eye on Noah Fant he didn't practice on Tuesday if he does play I think he's playable as well if he doesn't play I think Will Disley is a smash uh I'd love that love this spot um because once again these targets are going to have to go somewhere so Will Disley I think could be a very solid third option in the offense in the event that Noah Fant is out uh Noah Fant could just be getting you know like some rest maintenance type of stuff um early in the week so we'll have to keep an eye on it, but at either 3,400 or 2,700, whoever it is down here, uh, I think both are playable if you're getting to some heavier exposures with Seattle. Uh, wouldn't go crazy with, with either one. You don't need 20% of, of any one of these guys to get all that much leverage on the field. Um, but if you're trying to get to some really expensive players elsewhere, the Justin Jeffersons, the Steph Diggs, the Jamar Chases of the world... Um, then I think a 27 or a $3,400 tight end is probably going to help out in that regard and in, in line of construction. So uh, something to keep in mind there, these are playable pieces in deeper tournament builds. Um, do want to mention that the Chiefs defense is terrible. Uh, they give up points in spades. So Seattle can score. And even without Tyler Lockett, you can still get to some, some Kenneth Walker here. Not super crazy about the price at 64, but he's, I'd, like I said, I'd rather play him than, than David Montgomery. Um, no Seah Seahawks defense against Chiefs. They'd have to be free. Uh, Kansas City on the other side. Now, this is going to be hard to get to Mahomes at 84, Travis Kelsey at 8,000, because there's other expensive guys that we really do want to play. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of cheap running back value that we can um, you know, really eat some of the salary with. Uh, so most of the good running back plays are actually relatively expensive this week. So that's going to make it even harder to get to both Mahomes and Kelsey. Um, that said, it's going to keep their ownership in check. And and both of these guys, I mean, they're going to steam. Mahomes will be 15% and Kelsey will be 20 by the end of the week for sure, uh, as they should be. I mean, this is definitely the best spot of the day against Seattle's pass defense, who is terrible. So um, you can absolutely play them if you can make it fit. Uh, not going to argue with any any constructions that that make that happen. Um, Jarek McKinnon, he's popped two weeks in a row now, and we know the upside is there. So in high pace games, in the event that this is a high pace game, Jarek is probably going to see a good bit of volume. He's been very very efficient in the in the passing game. Um, obviously, some outlier performances for him, and we got to be careful of that. Uh, because a lot of the upside is no is priced in now at 5900, so just something to be aware of there. Um, if you want to pivot off of some of the Jarek chalk that's likely to come in, you can get to Isaiah Pacheco. At the moment, we're actually seeing that Pacheco is the more popular, so he's not really a pivot. But um, 5700, I think this is one of the cheaper running backs that you could consider because Seattle's rush defense is also bad. So. Perfectly fine to get to basically everybody on this offense. We do have to keep in mind, however, that McCole Hardman may very well be activated, which would really take me off of both Kadarius Tony and MVS. Now, I am going to victory lap the MVS touchdown from last week. Uh, you've been playing him every week, and he, he finally caught one. Um, so that's great. But if McCole Hardman gets activated again, I mean, th these three guys down here as the, what, third and fourth option in the offense. Uh, they're all going to be sharing work and it's going to be, it's going to make it really, really hard to peg who gets the, the bulk of it. So that would take me off of all of them. And if one of them beats me, which probably would happen, uh, you're just going to have to let it happen. I think it's going to be very, very difficult unless you're playing a boatload of KC teams to land on the right guy, just in like a single entry or, or 20 max or something like that. It's going to be very difficult. Um, Really like Juju at 5,800, however. So really, no matter what happens with Hardman, I like Juju a lot. Uh, 58, his target share has been steadily increasing, and the price hasn't moved. So 
Uh, this is a fantastic spot, and I think if you want to, if you want to get off of Travis Kelsey, I don't think that's bad. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a gulp every time you fade Travis Kelsey. Certainly in a good matchup, but uh, pivot it right to Juju. I think that's that's a fine play, and you're saving 2,200 here, which you can disperse elsewhere to some of the other plays. And I think that's fine. You're still gonna likely get 10, 12 targets in a high pace game. And yeah, I think the upside is, is definitely there for Juju. Some of it is not priced in at 5,800. So um, Chiefs defense is going to pop a little bit and steam. I think it's a really intriguing price here. If we want to target some alternate alternative game scripts against Seattle, where Seattle does not score uh, and is trailing and is just chucking the ball left and right, um, that increases the upside for the Chiefs defense. Now, once again, they are a pretty attackable unit in general. They they still give up 23 points a game, which is not nothing. Um, it's a pretty high number, and they're definitely not one of the, the most efficient units in the league. So I would be careful with this. If this ownership number steams, um, I would not be super enthused about it. But very good point per dollar and mid-20s value score is excellent for a defense, certainly at the price. So uh, it's definitely playable. Um, but you're going to have to get this game right in most scenarios because it's probably going to be hard to find winning tournament teams that include or don't include anybody from that game. Uh, okay, moving on, Cincinnati and New England. New England's really good pass defense here, really good run defense too. So Maybe a little bit of a difficult spot here for Joe Burrow. However, I think the Bengals are the best team in the AFC, personally. Um, maybe not the most explosive offense, but in aggregate, I think they are are just as good. I mean, they beat the Chiefs earlier. I think they're better than Buffalo. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see the Cincinnati Bengals in the Super Bowl again this season. That said, at low ownership, even in a bad matchup against a good pass defense, I think playing one of the best teams in the conference is warranted every single week. So we get him at low ownership. Yeah. Like sign me up 7,000 for Joe Burrow. He's not going to run. Um, so we know where most of the production is going to come from and it's going to come in the passing game. So the Bengals are actually, um, a little bit more balanced than you would think, but they're still a 57 43 split in favor of the pass. So they're, they're chucking it. A lot of it is dump offs to, you know, Joe Mixon or whatever, but um, that means we can play all of these guys and have some relatively high confidence levels that they're going to actually realize their volume averages. Uh, and of course, we can get to Jamar Chase, 8,300. Really like this price for him uh, in this particular matchup because you know, relative to a lot of the other more expensive guys on the slate, they're in admittedly better spots fundamentally. Uh, he's still... Target share wise, he gets just as much work as Justin Jefferson and just as much work on a weekly basis as Cooper, as Pete Cooper Cup does. So, um, and, it, you know, Joe Burrow's a better quarterback than both Kirk Cousins and Matt Stafford, you know what I mean? So, um, he's got just as much upside as Justin Jefferson up here or a DK Metcalf in, in this spot or Travis Kelsey or anything like that. And he's going to come in at far less ownership. So uh, I think this is a good pivot in tournaments. If you want to, you can play him in cash if you want. I mean, it's perfectly fine. Um, once again, not a, not the best spot because we, we may have some weather concerns and a good defense over here. Uh, so the total in this game may be a little bit prohibitive. It's sitting just 41 and a half right now with the with the Bengals laying three and three and a half on the road. Um, so those are some concerns or you know, that we might need to keep in mind, right? But that doesn't mean we can't get to any of the passing game here. Uh, not super jacked about T. Higgins, uh, 7,000. He looks fine. Looks like the hamstring. He didn't tweak anything. And and he would, he's okay. I think the price delta between he and Jamar Chase is where it should be now. Um, I think T maybe a little bit, maybe a couple hundred bucks uh, more expensive than than I would like to see. I'd like to, love to see him at 6,800 or something. Um, but 7,000 uh, is fine. Whatever you can play him, it's fine. I wouldn't play these two guys together necessarily because once again you're going to need probably New England to score. Um, and it's a it, Admittedly, it's a fundamentally bad matchup. It's a really good pass defense over here. Tyler Boyd still not touching him. He caught five balls last week, but he's got a busted finger. 
and I, I'm just not dealing with it. If he beats me, he beats me. Um, but I, I'm not playing the game with hand injuries with uh, third wide receivers in an offense. Just not, ha- especially in a bad matchup. Uh, no thanks. Um, Joe Mixon, once again, bad matchup. Uh, New England rush defense, just 4.2 yards a carry, 110 yards on the ground per game. Very efficient scoring defense, uh, sc- scoring rushing defense, that is, as well. So Joe Mixon's upside definitely capped in, in the fundamental respect. Um, also, we have Samaj P. Ryan to contend with a little bit as well in terms of volume. So keep that in mind. Um, but if you're playing Bengals stacks, I think mixing in Joe Mixon is, of, of course, warranted all the time, and nobody's going to play him. So you know, sub-10% is effectively nobody um, for somebody with like Mixon or somebody that has Mixon's upside. So I think it's fine to get to the Bengals. Um, don't really want to deal with their defense necessarily. Um, not jacked about a 3,400 defense. Uh, against a team that's not likely to throw the ball a whole hell of a lot, just 30 attempts a game for the Patriots' offense, um, and you know Cincinnati's pass defense is, is fine. They're a little bit better than league average. Give up 225 yards a game, you know, and 11 and a half yards of a catch. It's it's nothing crazy. It's about average. Um, Mac Jones, however, on the other side, he stinks. So there is there's some upside for the Bengals' offense in that regard. Um, you know, it's just about two and a half sacks a game that the Patriots offensive line yields. So not too terrible, um, a play for the Bengals at 3,400, but not my favorite of the week necessarily either. Um, on the other side for the New England offense, uh, it's Ramondre. It, that, that's pretty much it. He was excellent last week and at 7,100, his price didn't really move. Uh, he came back with a supposed ankle injury or whatever didn't practice all week he was questionable that's just bill belichick games i he plays that he's been doing it for years uh so very clearly Ramondre was fully healthy um i don't know why he does it he, he doesn't fool anybody belichick when he when he plays that game but you know it is what it is uh so no worries with Ramondre as of right now um you can play him and and run Use him as the run back in any Bengal stacks that you play. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's contrarian, and it's a very, very good tournament build. It's got a lot of upside, and uh, not a lot of people are going to play it. So um, really don't want to play Mac Jones. He popped a lot last week, but like, he's terrible. Uh, it, it may very well be time for Bailey Zappi season. I don't know. Um, Jacoby Myers, no thanks. It, I mean, you could play him. It, it's okay. We need to see his target share. I mean, we've only got two weeks to see it, but uh, we need to see it sort of ramp back up to his early season work. Um, He's on the field still. And in the event that they are trailing, uh, I think Mac Jones probably going to have to throw the football a little bit and it's going to go to Jacoby. So um, especially if Devontae Parker is out again, uh, not sure. I believe it was a concussion, but I could be making that up. Um, if he's out again, then I, I like Jacoby a little bit more. 4,800, once again, it, it's all right. It's fine for a number one receiver. Their pass, def- or pass offense, rather, it really isn't all that great. Um, but the Bengals' defense, once again, is pass defense is uh, about league average. So um, nothing super exploitable in that respect for Jacoby or any of the um, any other parts of the New England passing game, like a Hunter Henry or a Nelson Aguilar or whatever. Um, but, you know, it, it's a playable deeper tournament piece. Probably some better plays a little bit cheaper, like a Marquise Goodwin, for example, in Seattle. Um, but it, it's fine at, at depressed ownership for the most part. And as a run back in Cincinnati stacks. Uh, no Patriots defense at 2,700, although they are popping quite a bit here. Um I like I like the Bengals here. I, th- I think it's a very good offense and very difficult to target. They, they are going to be throwing the ball, so there could be opportunities. And, and once again, the Patriots are a good unit. So if you land on 2,700 New England, I don't think that's bad at all. Okay, uh, Detroit, Carolina. Um, we're kind of yapping a little bit here, as is typical. Try and get through this in the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Um, really don't want much to do with this game. Uh, but I, I do think there are some playable pieces. Goff and Amon Ross St. Brown, I think, are a playable stack here. 
at 5,400, it makes it a little bit cheaper to get to Amon Ra, who I think is a really, really good play. Um, Carolina's pass defense is uh, well below league average, and that's definitely the way we want to attack them in general. They got a pretty good rush defense, um, but their pass defense is, is below league average. So uh, they give up some production. It, it's not like super downfield stuff, um, but Amon Ra will run 10, 12, 15 yard routes. Um, you know, the average A dot for Detroit is a little bit shallower than, you know, maybe some other teams in the league. Um, and the, the Panthers defense actually do allow a little bit uh, deeper A dot than, than average. So a um, little bit of exploitability here for Amon Ross St. Brown. At 7,800, I think it's a good price, and he's coming in at reduced ownership to nor where we normally see him in, like, outrageously good matchup. So uh, I think getting to both he and Goff in a stack is, is a really good way to play it. I'm off the running back room in in Detroit pretty much entirely. Uh, you've got Swift, you've got Jamal Williams, but you also have Justin Jackson down here who got a boatload of snaps this last week. And that that's a significant risk for the other two guys, right? Um, you know, we know that they're both capable and they're going to pop in some optimization models. But if, if they're getting vultured in terms of like they they got to be on the field in order to produce here. So um, if Justin Jackson is is down there getting third down work, I mean that takes me off of Swift. If, if he's getting earlier down work, it takes me off of Williams. You know, like uh, at these price tags, you just can't play it when they're in a full third, a third, a third timeshare here. Um, it 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 just makes it unplayable. It's very difficult to get to. So uh, don't want any of the you know, tertiary or quaternary pieces for the Detroit offense or passing game either. Uh, DJ Chark, you could consider as a, a deeper tournament dart at 4,200. Um, and in like heavier Detroit stacks, if you run a Goff, Amon Ron, and a Chark, I think that's okay. It's not bad if you want to run it back. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but that's pretty much it. No Josh Reynolds, none of this Khalif Raymond nonsense or Brock Wright. Can't really count on him to catch another 65 yard touchdown pass. Uh, Carolina on the other side, as I said, I don't really want to stack Sam Darnold, so it's not going to be runbacks from Detroit that I, I want to target. It's going to be mostly uh, runbacks from Carolina, and that'll be DJ Moore and Deontay Foreman. Um, I like both of these guys. I think the prices are playable, and the spot definitely warrants some interest because Detroit's defense, while they've been much better, markedly better than they were earlier in the season— in aggregate, their, start, their numbers are still terrible, right? They still give up 4.9 yards of carry and 135 yards on ground per game and some touchdown equity as well. So that that leans me uh, or tilts me toward Deontay Foreman a little bit, 5,300. Once again, we're, we're starving for some cheaper running back value this week, and I think Deontay Foreman could qualify as one of those pieces. Um, now, Point per dollar and value wise, like the projection is just pretty low because overall Carolina plays at a pretty slow pace and their rushing offense isn't very good. Just four and a half yards of carry and about 120 yards a game. So um, if he does have to contend with some Chuba and maybe even some Raheem Blackshear down here, kind of takes me off that a little bit. But I think he is a deeper tournament viable dart that you could consider to keep in your pools. Um, DJ Moore, like I said, I, I do really like 5,500, uh, Detroit's pass defense is also very attackable. The problem that we've had all season with DJ Moore, it's not his talent level. It's that the quarterbacks that are throwing him to ball are just terrible, right? Sam Darnold is awful and he doesn't have any upside. So, um, that said, if there were a week for a terrible quarterback to pop, it would be against a bad pass defense, which, you know, Detroit is offering us here. So, uh, it's, it's possible but uh, it's it's well down the list, probably, I don't know, 10th or 12th stack, um, and probably even further than that uh, for me. And I'd have to, like, force teams in, and uh, you couldn't pay me to force in uh, Sam Darnold in most scenarios. So just uh, DJ Moore and Deontay Foreman for me in most instances. Terrace Marshall is a deep tournament dart that you could consider as well. Once again, uh, you've got low pace, very, very slow offense. Uh, for Carolina, and really not a very good pass offense either. You know, they only averaged, what, 27 attempts a game and about 170 yards, so um, really not a whole lot of upside in general. Uh, mostly just DJ Moore and Deontay Foreman for me here. Um, 
Defenses, though, you could consider. Obviously, the Panthers' defense, 2,300. They're, they're popping uh, a good bit so far. Um, it's it's difficult because their their defense is okay. Uh, their rush defense is good, right? Pass defense is about league average, but we're attacking a, a pretty powerful offense over here in Detroit. So um, not my favorite play, but if you land on 2,300, it's, it's perfectly fine. Okay. New Orleans and Cleveland, I mean, this is ridiculous. I don't know if you guys have ever seen any of this. Um, but in all my years of following the NFL and betting markets, I've never seen a total this low. It is at 31.5 right now and 32. It bottomed at 30.5. And, a half, and uh, that that's the craziest thing I think I've ever seen in an NFL game. Naturally, how did that happen? Well, it's because we got a serious weather concerns here um the offenses aren't very good number one right so we got that the, the total opened to like 37 38 but with weather concerns i mean we're talking 25 to 30 mile an hour sustained winds snow very cold temperature it's going to be miserable in cleveland or projects to be um that that total got bet down within 24 hours about seven points so uh did, like that was insane i actually would consider, you know, like teasing a total down here this low, just because, like, this is an outlier here. Um, and we could very well see something like we saw last week in the Buffalo-Miami game, where most of the game, there's just no weather concern whatsoever. It was just cold, right? No wind, anything like that. So um, if you want to take a punt, I mean, like, full disclosure, I've already taken a little bit of a punt uh, on the over in the betting market. So that said, uh, we don't want to touch any of this game in, in DFS. Um, the fundamental spot is okay for some of the running game, but Alvin Kamara, like he just doesn't have the volume that we need to be paying 6,800 for a running back. Um, even in this matchup, like the Browns rush defense is terrible. They give up five yards of carry 135 yards a game and some scores, but the New Orleans rush offense is awful. One of the worst units in the league, just four yards a carry, 100 yards a game. So perhaps a little bit of upside for them to outperform their their league averages, but um, I don't trust this offense. They're, they're just bad because what they do is they give a lot of this work to Taysom Hill down here, who is super tilting. Um, given the weather concerns here, I think that considering a Taysom Hill punt stack, uh, or not a stack necessarily, but Taysom Hill naked one-offs. I don't think this, like, you could do worse, I think. Um, not much worse. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty bad play. But uh, there could be a little bit of upside here in this type of game and weather script for Taysom Hill. They're going to use him a lot, and that makes Andy Dalton wholly unplayable pretty much in every respect and certainly in a game where we got weather concerns. So I'm off the receiving game entirely. No Olave for me, even though I love the kid. No Rashid Shahid even though Taysom Hill threw a bomb to him last week, just nothing. The only passing game piece that I would consider would be Juwan Johnson. He's a big, big body, and he has a lot of sort of middling um, kind of tight end yardage upside that some of the other tight ends on the slate might not have. And in the event that we do actually see some score, I mean, somebody's going to have to score to win this game in theory, um, I think there's a pretty decent probability that it could come to Juwan Johnson from the, the Saints' perspective. So um, really, really decent play. But once again, I wouldn't go crazy with the exposures. If you get 5 to 8%, I think that's plenty and to not expose yourself too much to the weather here. Uh, but that that's it. Um, nobody on the offense, maybe like three or five Taysom Hill naked teams. Uh, maybe stack one of them with the Juwan Johnson or something, but that, but that's really it. Um, and only in super deep tournament stuff. Cleveland on the other side, same sort of deal. I don't want anything to do with Sean Watson. They've looked awful in the last few weeks since he's come back. Uh, they haven't been able to do anything in some really good spots. And uh, price tag still elevated for him, and, and we have weather now, so no thank you. Um, so similar deal. I'm not touching any of the Cleveland passing room here with Amari. Uh, he's overpriced, and DPJ is a better receiver. So um, you could also consider, for the same reason that you would consider Johnson on the other side, you could play David Njoku, but that's only if the damn guy plays. He's hurt again. He didn't practice again on Tuesday. Um, so if he's on the field, great. But, you know, you got to be on the field in order 
to to play the guy. So uh, this this dude's just super super tilting. Um, Browns defense you could consider 3,800 in this type of weather game. I think it's fine, but be aware that they're very unlikely to be throwing the ball on the other side. Same thing with the Saints defense. Um, it's probably going to be a rush heavy script in most scenarios. Chubb, if you want to get to it, it's all right. Uh, but unfortunately at 7,700, you generally need about 25 to 25 carries to, to really pay that off just in terms of volume. Because if, if they don't score, um, even 25 carries at, at four yards a carry, I mean, that's a hundred yards and, and that's really 13 points on DK and that's it, you know? Um, so you, you need more upside than that. Uh, and in this type of weather with other running backs that are in far better spots and they don't have to deal with, with the weather, um, and just an incompetent head coach and, and Stefanski, uh, then, you know, I, I'd just rather come off the game entirely. And I think in most scenarios, if you just X this game on the whole, then you're probably just going to end up making money. So Moving on, uh, Atlanta and Baltimore, see if we can get through this pretty quickly uh, as well. Really don't want anything to do with Atlanta either. Um, Desmond Ritter started last week. He looked terrible, and he's probably going to look just as bad again this week. This is a bad spot for Atlanta stylistically because they want to run the football, and Baltimore's got a fantastic run defense, uh, one of the best in the league, if not the best. I believe they average, um, pulling it up on – the side here, yeah, 3.8 yards to carry, 85 yards per game that the Baltimore rush defense allows. That is amazing. That is one of the best, if not the best, units in the league. So um, very bad stylistic matchup here for Atlanta. I don't want anything to do with the running backs. Uh, no thank you. Same thing with the passing game. I don't really want anything to do with that, even though Baltimore is more exploitable. They're below league average in pass defense. But you've got Desmond Ritter here who just does not look comfortable yet. Um I still think that he's going to offer us a lot of upside going forward in the future, and he could pop a, a little bit for you know, 20, 22 points or something this week, and most of that production is going to come to Drake London or come from Drake London. Uh, so I, I like playing him. He still got a, a good bit of target share last week, so that this is fine to continue to mix into your pools. Price really hasn't moved. Um, so I think this is fine, but... Probably not playing Desmond Ritter. He'd be well, well down the list of quarterbacks. I'd rather just get to uh, a friend that will, you know, in the next couple of games, um, rather than uh, rather than paying 5K for Desmond Ritter here. So nothing else from the Atlanta offense for me. Uh, Atlanta defense, same deal. I, I don't really want to deal with them. I think they're bad. And at 3,000, I think they're probably overpriced. Baltimore here, uh, we got questions for Lamar. We have to wait and see if they're going to let him play. I hope they don't because I don't want to see him get hurt. And if this team does make the playoffs, well, number one, they got to win the game, but they don't need him to win the game uh, against Atlanta. Atlanta is that bad, and they get a you know a rookie quarterback over there who uh, is definitely not comfortable just yet. So um, despite the fact that I don't think Baltimore is all that good, you know, Atlanta is just markedly worse. So um, we don't really need Lamar here. I hope he doesn't play. If he does play, I think it's fine because you got to assume that, I mean, I think Harbaugh is probably the best coach in the league at the moment. And you got to assume that he's not going to jeopardize Lamar's longer term health just by rushing him out there too early to, to go beat the freaking Atlanta Falcons. So uh, if he does play, that brings me on to Mark Andrews a little bit. Uh, I, I would like that. Because Mark Andrews kind of needs Lamar here. Uh, Lamar l relies on him pretty heavily. And if he plays, I think at 5,500, he's one of the better tight end plays of the week. If he does not play, that takes me off of him nearly entirely. Um, you could still mix him in as a one-off, but I wouldn't be super confident in it because Huntley just doesn't use him. Um, who I do really like is J.K. Dobbins. At 5,800, he's been outrageously efficient in his two games back from the knee injury. He got Pittsburgh as a very, very good run defense for, I think, 13 carries, 125 yards or something. Um, and then last week against Cleveland, who's a bad run defense, he also got, I think, 14 or 15 carries. Once, excuse me, once again, popped over 125 yards. So he is pushing nine yards a carry and 28 carries since having returned. That is insane efficiency. So uh, Atlanta's run defense is terrible. 
right? They they give up 130 yards a game on the ground, and if Lamar doesn't play, I think a lot of that work is going to go to J.K. Now, I'd be surprised if he cracks 20 carries, but I wouldn't be surprised for him to hit 20. Um, 25 carries is almost certainly out of the question, but... In the event that uh, Lamar does not play, I like getting to J.K. as one of these cheaper running backs, you know, sub 6K that that you could mix into your deeper tournament pools at very low ownership. Um, this kid is insanely explosive. He's one of the better pure rushing backs in the league uh, when fully healthy. Um, if Lamar does play, I think you can still play J.K. and you can stack him sort of Lamar, Mark Andrews with J.K. Dobbins, and you could basically capture the entirety of the offense against a really, really bad defense over here in Atlanta, run it back with Drake London, and I think you're off to the races um, in a lot of scenarios. I think that's a pretty cool deep tournament build, but it would require Lamar to play. I don't want to do that with Tyler Huntley um, and would just focus all of my shares or most of my shares to get J.K. Dobbins in that event. Uh, Ravens defense you can play, though, however. I like a JK and a Ravens type of correlation play. A um, little bit more expensive than I would kind of prefer to play for a deep, to pay for a defense, but um, is a good unit. And they're going to get a once again a, a, an inexperienced quarterback um, that's likely to make some mistakes. So um, like the Ravens at, at 3,200, I think this is fine if you land on them. Okay. Uh, Washington, try and get through this as quickly as possible. I want nothing to do with this offense. Uh, I like them in general. I like Heineke, McLaurin, um, Jahan Dotson. I like Diami Brown. Uh, I like Curtis Samuel, right? I like all of these passing pieces in general, not in this spot. San Francisco is probably the best defense in the league. In aggregate, I want nothing to do with any of these dudes, including the running backs. Um, the only guy I would even remotely consider would be uh, Antonio Gibson at 5,300. Um, and if it really, even then, I'm not super stoked about it. You could play him in, as a flex. I think it's fine as a, a late game sort of flex play. That's probably okay, but I'm not touching Brian Robinson. Uh, San Francisco's rush defense is fantastic. They are right up there with Baltimore as one of the best units in the league. Um, they actually average 3.4 yards a carry and 75 yards per game. So that is the best number in the league. Um, and really even quite a bit better than Baltimore, to be quite honest, which is really hard to do. Uh, same thing with pass defense. They only give up 200 yards a game. Um, so in in total, they're giving up 275, 285 yards of total offense per game. Uh, San Francisco is. I mean, you just can't go anywhere near Washington here. Uh, Commander's defense at 2,400, same thing I don't really want to deal with. Uh, I think they're going to be trailing here um, quite a bit, and they're going to be giving up points, and I don't think Purdy is really going to be forced into making all that many mistakes because he's probably not going to have to throw the ball. He'll just give it to CMC here, and they're off to the races. Now, playing CMC at 8,800 seems a little aggressive at, at north of 20% ownership for the only reason that later the sole reason that, that Washington's rush defense is actually pretty damn good in itself. Four and a half yards of carry, 110 yards a game on the ground. Now, CMC doesn't need rush equity to, to really get there, of course. He, he'll capitalize it in the passing game, too. Um, but I think in this event, Washington's going to have a really, really tough time moving to football. So San Francisco can be as balanced as they so choose in in most outcomes. Um in this game here. So you could very well see a, uh, you know, CMC just kind of shit the bed a little bit um, and and not get nearly as much volume as he, as he would typically uh, or in, you know, otherwise higher pace games. Now, uh, both of these teams on offense do run a, a good bit of pace, right? So Washington can run a bunch of plays, so there could be some opportunity. That's why I think it's okay if you consider a an Antonio Gibson um, or even like a rare one-off Curtis Samuel or, or something like that uh, to try and just like hit a dart uh, against the San Francisco pass defense. But like heavy, heavy exposures to the other side here is really going to kind of make it difficult for a lot of the pieces on San Francisco to score as well. So if you want to play a Brock Purdy at 5,500, I, I think it's okay. I think there are better plays, but um, don't think it's bad. At Brandon Ayuk, you can mix in at 63 with the absence of Debo Samuel still. 
Um, but I do like George Kittle. One of the other, like he's, I prefer him, much prefer him at 53 than 55 for Mark Andrews, pretty much in any event. Um, definitely if Lamar Jackson is out. So I think you can play Kittle as another sort of late game flex here. 49ers defense, I just, you know, rambled on for 10 minutes about how good they are. At 3,900, you can absolutely play this unit. Um, they, just because of the price, they're going to have a little bit of difficulty spiking in the value score here. But at 4% ownership, 5% ownership for probably, you know, the best defense in the entire league, uh, I think that's great. And I'll pay 3900 for him. Seems fine. Um, everybody else, though, you know, not super interested in it. Um, and I will probably personally come in underweight on CMC. I think the price is a little too high. Don't like the spot all that much. And I think the ownership's too high, frankly. Um, okay, so let's get to Philly. Uh, there we are. And the sort of mustached um, elephant in the room, if you will, in Gardner Minshew. No idea if Jalen Hurst is going to play. If he does play, uh, I think we can play Philly. Okay, you can play him. You can play him with A.J. Brown. You can play him with Devontae Smith or Dallas Goddard, who did just get activated off of IR today. He will play this week. Um, might not see the same target share that he saw earlier in the season, but it is possible uh, that he spikes a little bit. Um, really, if Jalen Hurts plays or if he doesn't. I think it's... I'd, I'd almost prefer him not to play, and that I'd, I'd like Dallas Goddard a little bit more, just because I think because uh, Gardner Minshew is more likely to be throwing the ball. Um, Jalen Hurts was more likely to be taking some of his passing downs and turning them into rushing downs via the uh, run-pass option that they run. Um, so if Hurts plays, I like everybody. Uh Including the passing game, I, I made Philly the favorite before the news came out, um, and it was actually Dallas two and Dallas three in the betting markets before before the the big line movement. Um, so I came in and I like I bet Philly at the beginning of the week, um, and I'm quite underwater on those plays so far. But uh, I mean Philly is just a markedly better team. If Jalen Hurts plays, um, there is no way. The even playing at Dallas, that Dallas should be laying points. There's just none whatsoever. Um, so that said, uh, I like pretty much everybody on the offense. It's certainly the passing offense, but mostly I think uh, I like the rushing game with Hertz, Miles Sanders, and one of the one of the pass catchers or something. Uh, Miles Sanders, 6,200. We'll have to keep eye keep an eye on the ownership. If it spikes because Jalen Hurts is announced out, which is you know the most likely scenario here. Um, that would probably take me off a little bit, and I'd like to maybe pivot. But it's still fundamentally a, a fantastic spot. That's how we really want to attack the Cowboys' defense in most scenarios. Uh, it's it's on the ground. Their pass defense is well above average, um, and they only give up about you know 190 yards per game through the air, uh, compared to about 100. 40 yards on the ground and 4.6 yards to carry. So they're more exploitable on the ground with a rushing attack and Philly's rushing attack is fantastic. Uh, Miles Sanders averages about 5.2 yards a carry, I believe, um, if memory serves. And obviously a lot of their efficiency is coming from Jalen Hurts as well, but 5.2 yards a carry is 5.2 yards a carry from the, from the number one running back here. And, um, it's absolutely an exploitable spot against Dallas Cowboys. So uh, you can play everybody on the offense here in the events that Jalen Hurts plays. In the events that he does not play, um, we you know, play Gardner Minshew too. He's 4,800, and he's going to make all of this stuff a hell of a lot easier to get to. So uh, you're probably going to see a lot of the ownership get siphoned away by the other matchups here in the event that Minshew plays. I think he, it's probably a better play that puts me more on to Philly than if Hertz plays uh, because it's going to attract a lot more ownership and um, and the game will likely be a hell of a lot more competitive. But uh, Minshew's not bad. You know, he, he was relatively efficient in the one full season, I guess the two full seasons that he started down in Jacksonville. And the guy can chuck it, man. Like, he played under under Leach, I believe, in college, and um, I could be making that up. But no matter what, like, 
he can throw the football and and Sirianni over there like he's not a a bad offensive head coach um they're definitely far far better in the rushing game and in the rushing efficiency metrics than they are the passing game but they still average 12.2 yards a catch and you know seven and a half adjusted net yards per attempt that accounts for scoring and sack yardage that's one of the better marks in the league in terms of passing efficiency for the Eagles here. So uh, even getting a, a pretty good pass defense against the Cowboys, um, you can get to Gardner Minshew, make make your whole passing stack cheaper here, play him with Miles my, Sanders as well, get exposure to the running game, and and get some coverage there. I think that's perfectly respectable, uh, a perfectly respectable way to attack this game. Eagles defense on the other side, um, or quickly, let's go back. Uh they are at 2,200, obviously popping quite a bit. Um, you could consider playing them. Only trepidation I would have is that Dallas's pass offense, like they're they're pretty balanced and they're gonna throw the ball. But Dak, in aggregate, um, he generally doesn't turn the ball over a whole hell of a lot. I know he's, you know, kind of spiked in in that uh, department this season, but. Um, overall, he, he's normally pretty efficient in protecting the football. So, uh, Dallas, I, in most scenarios, I don't really expect to be trailing in this game, which would require Dak to throw the football more, which would put me on to the Eagles in terms of a, an opportunistic share a little bit more, but, um, you know, they're 2,200. You can play them. It's, it's fine. Uh, okay. So Dak on, on, on. Uh, for the Cowboys here at 6,100, not stoked about it. They don't, you know, they aren't all that efficient in a passing game. Um, and Philly's pass defense is fantastic. They're one of the best pass defenses in the league, right up there with San Francisco. They are excellent, uh, very, very efficient. 4.1 adjusted net yards per attempt. Um, they're one of the better. It could be the best mark in the league in that particular metric. So really not super stoked about getting to the Dallas passing game here. CD Lamb, 7,500, think he's overpriced in this matchup. I think the ownership number is also uh, a little elevated for this matchup. Uh, he can get there for sure, but it, I'm not super jacked about it. Not something I'm going to go out of my way to target here. I do like the running back, 7,000, 6,000 for Pollard and Zeke. I think both of these guys are killer tournament plays at the current ownership levels. Zeke, I almost like a little bit more, obviously because he's a thousand cheaper. Um, we know that Tony Pollard's more efficient, but I think both these guys are, are very, very playable. Uh, Dalton Schultz still not playing this. The, the volume is not there on a regular enough basis to be paying 4,200 and eating 12% ownership on a guy. It's, it's just not happening. Um, I would just much rather just pivot it to Michael Gallup at half the ownership, and they're basically the exact same play at the exact same price. So, um, and there's other tight ends I'd rather play. So give me a Michael Gallup over Dalton Schultz at the same price. Um, no Noah Brown for me because, once again, yeah, Philly's pass defense is fantastic. So uh, it doesn't mean I want to play Michael Gallup. Wouldn't go out of my way. I'd rather, once again, just play Marquise Goodwin up in the Seattle game. But it, 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 I'd much rather play either one of these guys than Dalton Schultz, personally. Um, Cowboys defense, 2,600. They're also going to pop. So it's kind of strange that we're still seeing – a pretty relative, I mean, a relatively high total, 47 and a half in this game, and both of the defenses in terms of DFS numbers are firing a little bit in the models. So, um, kind of curious, and keep that in mind as you're building teams. You can mix in some Cowboys and Zeke plays, or Pollard and, and Cowboys plays, something like that, uh, or play Miles Sanders in in Philly on the other side. Something like you could play these defenses with the running backs and it doesn't have to be just the the passing offenses that that go crazy in this game so um i like the game and i'm going to be targeting offense here most often uh but i do think that you know there there's routes for um pretty much everybody to get there in uh in a lot of different scenarios so so that's pretty much it for the full game breakdown. Uh, we're once again at about an hour here, just over. Uh, quickly, we'll go over stacks. Um, like a little bit of the Giants here against Minnesota. Of course, like Minnesota, you can get to them for sure. Like Hawkinson and, of course, J.J. and, and Thielen, of course. Um, like Dalvin still as well. Uh, I think you can play a lot of guys in this game. It's going to be one of the more popular games, though, so keep that in mind. Uh, nothing from Houston, just a run back, maybe a, a, a Nico, perhaps, if he plays. Um, probably off of Chris Moore, it, 
if Nico doesn't, to be quite honest. Uh, like Derrick Henry, of course. Um, if you want to run a deeper tournament dart, Robert Woods or a Traylon Burks, if he plays, that that brings Tannehill um, into play a little bit more, but only, once again, in deep tournament stuff. Uh, like Buffalo, for sure, as some contrarian, like Josh Allen, Steph Diggs type of stacks. Like Devin Singletary, uh, as well as James Cook a little bit. Uh, guys you can consider in your in your tournament pools. Um, on the other side, you can play Fields with Cole Komet. Would probably stay off of the other receiving core. I'm um, really not interested there. Obviously, play everybody in Seattle and Kansas City uh, as many ways as you can. Uh, there, there should be points, and, and a lot of them scored in this game. Cincinnati and New England, I like the Bengals here as a, another similar to Buffalo kind of contrarian stack. Uh, bad spot fundamentally, but... Um, I think it's okay to play them because they're exceptionally explosive. Detroit and Carolina, like Goff and Amon Ra, of course, and you could run it back with DJ Moore or Deontay Foreman. Nothing in the New Orleans-Cleveland game outside of maybe a punt in the on the over just because it's a ridiculously low number. Um, possibly a Juwan Johnson or a David Njoku, but maybe some Nick Chubb. I mean, I doubt it. Uh, nothing from Atlanta. Outside of Drake London, Baltimore really depends on what happens with uh, Lamar Jackson. But you can play him, but uh, mostly just J.K. Dobbins for me. Nothing from Washington for me and San Francisco. Uh, you could play probably just one-off pieces. Um, I think it's the best way to attack. Uh, Washington's defense, you know, pretty respectable unit over here. But Philly and Dallas, I think you play everybody in this game, to be quite honest. Um, less so uh, on the, the Dallas passing game. But I like the running backs uh, on both sides and really do like the um, the Minshew play in the event that Jalen Hurts is out. So uh, that's it, guys. Um, sorry, once again, we've, we've run a little bit over an hour here. But uh, once again, keep an eye on the projection updates as we move through the end of the week here uh, because we will have a lot of news come through uh, to sort out uh, some of the noise that we've got. So um, that said, happy holidays. Good luck.